pursuant to the provisions of section 2.68030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, please take notice that decisions of the Me Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County Community Oversight Board may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review under a common law writ of cert. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final de decision by the board. Other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure that time and procedural requirements are met. Uh, I think we have quorum here. I'm gonna call uh, out executive committee members, uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch. I don't think he's here. Ms. Ross. Present. And Mr. Sweeney. Present. Thank you. Uh, now I'll pass it over to Mr. Pinkley for the electronic meeting statement. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so Governor Lee has extended the um, remote meeting executive order through the end of the year through December 27th. Uh, the most recent executive order was executive order number 65. Uh, so to hold our meeting today, we just need a motion and a second uh, to hold this meeting electronically to conduct essential business to protect the uh, safety and welfare of Tennessee. Is there a motion? Uh, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. I have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Uh, I'll go through the roll call again. Mr. Campbell Gooch, not here. Ms. Ross. Here. Uh, is that a yes? <laughs> Sorry, yes. And Mr. Sweeney. Yes. And I vote yes as well, so that passes. All right, next is the approval of the minutes. Um, can I get an, a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Is there any focused discussion on the minutes? If there's none, uh, we can vote to approve them. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch is not here yet. Uh, Ms. Ross? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. And I vote yes as well. All right, I think we can go right into it. Uh, I'll pass it off to Director Fitchard for an update on the MOU negotiations. Director Fitchard, are you there? Yes, sorry, I was having some trouble getting my mute off. Okay, yes, yeah, so I had a meeting for the MOU. It actually was a um, meeting via a phone conference with Chief Hagar, and that happened yesterday. Um, so regarding the changes that were brought up, so I sent him a list of the changes that we kind of discussed the last time that we met. Um, there weren't really any real substantive changes to the MOU. Um, there was one portion of the MOU that we had to have um, some negotiation around, and that was um, when it re regarding the timeframes for the policy advisory reports and the proposed resolution reports. And so we spent some time talking about that and hashing out why um, <clears throat> the timeframes were important to kind of not go too long and to really be defined because I felt like if they're not defined that we could kind of get lost. It could be six weeks. It could be 10 weeks. Um, so we decided on 45 calendar days to stay in line with other timeframes that NMPD has in their policies. Um, and also if you know, we we both decided that with the 45 days, that kind of stays in line with what OPA's process is. Um, and so that's what we met with instead of um, 
business days or working days. Um, we kind of just kept it with the 45 calendar days and um, with an understanding that they would have the option to request an extension when needed. And then the MOU was sent to Metro Legal for a review and as well as sent to all of the, the um, negotiation parties. Is there any questions about the MOU? Okay. I have a question, Director sure. Fitzgerald. What, uh, you said you're sent it to Metro. Does that mean we still have to look at another draft, right? It's not, um, Yes, it will, it will come back to once once uh, Metro Legal looks at it to make certain that it's a, sign, a sound um, document, it will then come back um, to uh, the board or the executive committee. Um, I mean, it's not ready today, so I'm assuming that it would just, hopefully we'll have it ready by, um, it will be ready by, you know, the first of the week. So we would... I guess, take it into the next board meeting. Great, great. Are there any other questions about the MOU? If there are none, um, I think we can go on to the next agenda item, the auditing and reviewing complaints discussion. Okay. Um, so we have received several complaints regarding issues surrounding um, alleged police misconduct regarding some of the like very disturbing cases that have come to light in Nashville over the last week or so. Um, one was the case um, that everyone is familiar with regarding the NAACP's request for the COB to look into the hiring practices of officers um, and officer and and, um, and so Dr. Belier will address that policy proposal shortly because at, the, at our last board meeting we discussed that there was something that we could do in regards to the community and the NAACP's request that we um, do um, and and uh, I'm sorry do a policy or, or look into the hiring and policy the, the hiring practices of MMPD and so. We also received another complaint um, on Monday, and it was received from attorney Daniel Horowitz um, regarding a case that happened in 2018. Um, and this was a pretty noteworthy case as well, um, but the case was outside of our jurisdictional time frame. And attorney Horowitz asked that we make the referral to OPA on behalf of his client. So, you know, because he, he, he I'm, I'm assuming that he understood that there weren't there wasn't anything that we were going to be able to do with the 2018 case. Um, so I referred the case directly to OPA Director Maranti and I CC'd um, Acting Chief Drake and Deputy Chief Hagar. Um, and I also asked that we be kept informed of the outcomes of their investigation. Um, and so that just happened um, in, within the last day or two. So we haven't heard back from them regarding that case. And so it seems like we're going to get a few more of these um, cases. We we received a complaint today that was um, from a, from a person, and that case was also um, in 2018. But some of the some of the some of the issues also happened in 2019. So as as I was talking to um, Chair Martinez, I thought that it would be really wise for us to talk about the auditing and reviewing complaint process. Um, and I think that we should establish something that would um, help us assist with these types of cases that come because we're not going to be able to do any type of investigation on a case that happened prior to April 1st, 2019. But according to the, according to um, Amendment 1, the, um, it says that we have the option of establishing a monitoring program that provides an ongoing review or audit of the complaint process administered by MMPD's professional accountability. Um, so, I mean, we could just, you know, set that up. I wanted to talk about that today regarding um, just making certain that the cases that they have investigated um, when they come to our attention, that they are, um, they have been investigated um, and came up with the with the outcomes, and they did it in the way in the processes that were set forth in their um, in their policies. So, 
So uh, yeah, I think that, that we, I, I would like to have a discussion around that and see what the executive committee thinks about establishing that as an alternative. Thank you, Director Pitchard. This would be involving, so the part in the charter, it says uh, we have the authority to review or audit the complaint process. That's correct, of OPA? That's correct. Okay. Uh, Ms. Ross, I see your hand up. Uh, my concern is how far back um, are we considering? I mean, some of these were 2018, but once you open the can of worms, it can go back to 2000, 2001 or two. So any suggestions on that? I think um, wouldn't actually be opening a, a full investigation. This would just be an auditing of the of what OPA's investigation. So we would just take a look and see, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, we would examine OPA's process and outcome and judge whether that meets our standards, but it's not necessarily investigating the case. Is that right? That's correct. It's not investigating it. It is, it's just auditing it and, you know, making certain that whatever policies and procedures that they that they have in place, that they follow those procedures. Thank you. Ms. Frost, does that clear up your question? Yes, it clears up, but my question is how far back are we going to look at the data? Okay, yeah. So, um, I don't know, should we put a time limit on this given, you know, it's not, you know, how much work is going to be involved, but it's not, since it's technically not an investigative case, does it fall under the time jurisdiction that we put in our bylaws? Mr. Sweeney's hand is up. Mr. Sweeney? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that there's a reason at this point to set up an auditing procedure. Um, these several new matters that we have haven't been investigated by OPA at all yet. So I don't, I don't think it's at a stage of auditing where we refer the mobile mass to be kept informed and advised. I think that if and when we're going to do an auditing process, then we probably should come up with some kind of, you know, statistically appropriate method of review and figure out what and how and how many years back we would go to do it. But at this point where we're still trying to figure out how to handle our own complaints and we're not there yet, I don't think that it's the best use of our resources to audit what OPA is doing where we don't have a reason, specific reason, to think that there is some major issue. And so I would kind of continue on with what we're doing and get our system up and operating deal with the matters that are outside of our jurisdiction by referrals and asking to be kept informed and then waiting on the auditing. Because I think once we decide to do that, that's going to be a very major commitment of time because even though we're not going to be investigating, we would be reviewing investigations that have been done and, and getting into the nitty gritty of those to see how and what and why and when. So, I don't, I don't think that it's it's our highest priority or our best use of resources at the moment. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney, um, Mr. Campbell Gooch. <clears throat> Thank you for that. I keep getting dropped off. Uh, just a warning for everybody. I'm, I seem to be having some technical difficulties, um, but I do have a couple of questions. My first question is uh, for executive executive Fitcher. What are, would be the benefits of starting to at least rough draft or think through what an audit, what an auditing process for OPA's policies? What would be the benefits of that? 
Well, I think the benefit is we would make certain we would be able to make certain that the that what their standard operating procedures are, that they have followed those. And I think that that would help the community, um, especially when it comes to some of the things that are coming up now, when people are really wanting to know and have a distrust of a process that's already in place with OPA, that the, the COB is able to at least um, be able to audit their their investigation and say it was sound or, it, or if there was something that needed or wasn't done that we could say, well, you know, there was one part that, you know, we felt like needed to take, have some more, um, take a second look at. So I think that it would build, it would build trust in the process. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. And so what type of, um, so if you can just give me just like what type of resources, an idea of what type of resources you would need at your disposal to try to execute that the best to, to the best of your ability. Well, I think that, of course, we would need to hire another investigator. Um, is that's one of the things that we would need. And then the second thing is, as we are, as we don't have um, complaints, active complaints coming in, investigations, then our investigators would be able to do these audits. And so that would be the process to assign those randomly or however to our investigative staff now because we you know we are not necessarily uh, getting complaints um you know we might get two right now with the pandemic we've been getting one or two a month hmm, okay so how heavy of a lift um at current capacity without a new investigator how heavy of a lift would this be for your office well, I think if we started it at this exact right now at this time, it would become it would be a little problematic because we still have a back caseload. But we're not talking about establishing it immediately. We're talking about for the future of having this as a as a um, second tool to put eyes on cases. So we're talking about you know some months from now. Okay, uh, thank you for that. I think you built you built in a lot of connections uh, for me personally. Um, and I definitely identify, especially with the sound, uh, making sure that things are sound, especially if we're having to refer cases over to another body. Um, and what you kind of, what emerged for me as you were speaking is like, how do we cover, um, how do we cover the community members that first come to us, but then we have to send them somewhere else? So... I like the idea of auditing another body's policies just to make sure that we are providing proper over oversight for the entire process. So I'm a fan and I'm just like so curious about this. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Kamaguch. Uh, Mr. Sweeney? I would think that if we would want to audit that it would be some kind of systemic sort of audit that we would want to do. You know, for example, that what we'd be looking at would be the broad system rather than individual matters, unless the particular individual matters that came to light. So, for example, that we would want to um, identify any matter where there was a, a um, complaint of a misuse of force or a use of excessive force. And then <clears throat> from that group, we would want to be able to draw some cross section of those. And that then we would be looking at those not as to policies particularly, but we would be looking at the individual investigation from the beginning to end as to how it was done. So, I mean, I would think that if we want to do an audit or a monitor, that we would want to set up, you know, a, a, a um, formal, broad, um, research-based sort of process, and that what we're receiving so far are 
individual matters that have come to us that we can't handle. And so that's why we're referring them over because they're outside of our jurisdiction. Um, and that as to those, you know, if we get the feedback that we're requesting, that that might be the most effective way as to those. And as for the monitoring or auditing, that we hold that in reserve until we have our own system working right. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. So I'm hearing that we should maybe wait to do this. Uh, I know Mr. Kamaguch, you uh, sounded like you wanted to get started on this. Um, yeah, Mr. Kamaguch. Yeah, uh, just just to provide a little clarity, and I because I want to hold uh, what the executive director said, which was um, we were not going to do this now because it would present a lot of problems, and also hold what Mr. Sweeney is saying about making sure that it's robust and sound. Uh, so what I what I the what I'm proposing is that we at least start visioning this out. So when it's so when it's time to launch, we are not only presenting a robust program. That the every single board member understands what we're what we got going on. Thank you, Mr. Kamaluch. Do do you have a vision of how we can start that planning process? Um, or Director Fitcher? Well, no, I don't have one at this exact moment to talk about, but I can start thinking about it in the process. I, I think one of the things that we, one of the things that we wanted to do that we felt was important was to try to get our backlog moved forward because we have backlogs of cases. Um, and I think that we would get, we will have that completed by the first quarter of 2021. And we should be really clear um, in, in um, clearing out our back case log from this whole year. And that means getting those um, to um, getting those to the board for the PRRs and all of that. And I think that would be, the, I think the best time, which is the second quarter of Jan, um, of 2021, like you know, from really from like April to June, um, and that is when we could. So we would start in January um, to March, preparing on what this would look like. So that we could launch and or even talk about it or get it prepared um, for the second quarter of 2021. Okay, thank you, Director Fitcher. I think then we can hold off on planning while MNCO gets caught up with the investigations that they have on their plate and then focus on the auditing after that's done toward the end of the first quarter, as Director Pitcher said. Um, if there's no objection to that, I don't know if we need a motion, but um, we can, if there's nothing else on that, uh, we can move on to the policy advisory report proposals with Dr. Villiers. All right, thank you. Um, we have received two different requests for research from community organizations. One was from the NAACP and the other from NOAA. And those should have been sent to the executive committee last night. Um, we develop research proposals for each request as is the process that we go through with every research request that we do that we receive. And um, so I'll just briefly discuss what those are, and then um, we can discuss sort of what the next steps of the process are. So the NOAA response or NOAA proposal, NOAA asked us to look specifically into or to create an estimate of the number of calls for service that are mental illness related uh, to, to look at the scope of mental illness calls that could be diverted to a cahoots based crisis intervention model, as well as to look at best or effective practices of 911 call takers diverting calls for service into alternate response 
uh, organizations. And based on that request, uh, we worked up a proposal that would um, answer those questions as well as go a little bit more in depth into um, the types of calls for service um, that could, that based on different models around the country of how Kahoot's style programs are being implemented may be diverted and, and developing some estimates around that for multiple types of call response as well as uh, geographic areas where um, those types of calls are most common, and as well as the effective practices for emergency communications. Um, so that is one proposal that we worked up. Um, and the second was discussed at the board meeting last month, and it's related to um, the, the background investigation process for hiring new officers. And uh, the NAACP brought forward an incident that um, raised some broader questions around the role of background investigations and the types of past, event, uh, past events that disqualify officers. And this also brings up um, broader questions around other aspects of the selection process and what's disqualifying in background investigations and whether or not those are um, uh, those should be the criteria or whether there is a room for the COB to issue policy uh, recommendations related to background investigations. Um, a second aspect of uh, NAACP's discussion was on investigating potential biases in recruits prior to employment. And so we developed two research questions that um, we would investigate though, or would research those two aspects on um, the recruitment process and background checks, as well as uh, potential biases for recruits. So um, as we did receive, since we are not able to investigate the actual incidents um, on the investigation side of MNCO and COB, um, this, does that instance does bring up some larger systemic issues that are a good example of where our research focus um, may be able to lead to some policy development and policy recommendations um, that in the future would um, limit the likelihood of a similar event. Um, so these two proposals, um, we will be able to we'll send them to the entire board for discussion at the meeting next month. Um, but as you know, we're receiving multiple proposals. One of the uh, processes of the board is to make sure that we are prioritizing our resources uh, as efficiently as possible. And we already have one ongoing uh, policy advisory research project on auditing use of force records that we're actively working on. And realistically, based on our um, staffing, we only really have the ability to work on probably two project projects actively at a time. And so one thing that I think will be helpful to discuss with the executive committee is where you all think we should be prioritizing our efforts on these two proposals and where they fit into um, our research agenda. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Does anyone have any suggestions on that? Um, I think I would ask you how you feel or what, what do you think is, is the most important um, project that we sh MNCO should be focusing on? Both projects, I think, are very valuable. Um, they both have significant issues that um, are pressing community concerns around crisis intervention on the one hand and about background checks and recruitment on the other hand, right? So I think both are valuable. And I think as we're looking forward, both I th are projects where I do think that uh, the COB's research program should um, be involved. And so 
I think the question uh, for me would come back to sort of thinking, you know, what are board members thinking are those priorities? Mr. Sweeney. Uh, question. Um, how long do you think it would take to do each of them? Or, or better said, um, from a start date, which do you think could be finished first? Um, I think the background investigations might be a slightly quicker project. Um, I, I still, I think the sort of time frame from that for that would, with moving through the board process, would probably be um, three months until we're able to get a final report from the out from the board, um, with probably able to get a draft to the board within two months. So that would put us at the January board meeting. Ms. Ross. I, I also was thinking the length of time there that would take to work on these proposals. Um, I kind of would probably favor the one with the NAACP uh, with the new chief coming in and we could have some recommendations if needed by the, uh, somewhere around his new arrival. His or her, I'm sorry. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, um, excuse me if, if, if my question is due to a lack of knowledge, but the, pol the policy advisory proposal um, around MMPD's hiring procedures, is that something that the policing commission is already working on, or am I just confused on which direction that is going? Yes, that's a component of the policing commission is on the recruitment and retention. And there's likely going to be recommendations coming out in the next couple of weeks from the police policy commission that will address aspects of the background check process. Um, they, I'm not, I don't know how in depth they will get into background checks. However, that's another consideration that um, there will be recommendations already that will be addressed by the next police chief. Okay. Um, um, and, 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 and we're doing the lifting on that research specifically from the commission, right? Uh, well, the commission has did a lot of work to interview um, MMPD staff who work in the HR department and the background investigations, and they've had many of those conversations. And so I, I think one aspect of any report that we do will be um, taking into account all of the any of the recommendations related to the background check process that are released by the mayor's office. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Doctor. I have I, did I have like one more thing that I'm thinking through. Um, if that is the case, it almost feels like, and this is not a complete idea, but it almost feels like we should be just waiting to see what the what the police commission comes out with so that we're not doubling up on work and then lean further into um, the NOAA uh, piece about deferring 911 calls. Um, that's just that's just where I'm at, but I can be moved on on all of this. Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Mr. Sweeney. Um, Following up on that, um, the Policing Commission report is going to be coming out very soon. Is that right, Mr. Valier? Is that what's expected? Yes, I believe the deadline is coming up next week, hopefully, and uh, it likely will be out in the next week or two. Okay. Do you know 
are they also dealing with the issue of crisis intervention? Uh, the policy committee from the Policing Policy Commission uh, is addressing the uh, crisis intervention as well. Um, this is a aspect of that that's not being addressed. So there was discussion in the policy uh, committee, uh, sorry, subcommittee, that was focused on different crisis intervention models. And NOAA specifically requested that we are, that we look at um, estimating the amount of calls that could be disaggregated or that could be diverted, since that was not an aspect that was uh, discussed in the Policing Policy Commission as far as um, what sort of scale or scope an alternative response program uh, would be able to or would would have the demand for. Okay, so so is it fair to say that both of the, the research projects that we're looking at would supplement areas that the police commission, policing commission is looking at, but wouldn't duplicate. I do believe both would supplement. I have, I don't know as much about the level of duplication for the background checks. Um, just because I was not in, as involved in the uh, workforce uh, committee of the Police Policy Commission. So I, there may be some overlap, but you know, in anything we do, I always aim not to duplicate efforts, but to build on. And so when that report comes out, if that's the project that we are asked to work on, we would, you know, look at everything that's coming out from the mayor's office and try to build on their work rather than duplicate. Okay. And do I also understand correctly that you don't think that you could get to either of these new projects to even begin anything beyond what you've done so far until January. I believe that would be a, a realistic timeline um, to really look at January uh, for either project as having the draft to the board. Um, since we only have the board meeting next week and then in December, uh, that would be a very tight timeline uh, to turn around uh, the background research as well as writing the report. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. So it sounds like I think that we can wait on these at least until, well, first of all, can the executive committee approve um, a proposal? No, the the board would have to would approve the proposal. Um, we are planning. We made a revision to the background investigate or the background check proposal based on news reporting that came out yesterday afternoon, and we we are planning on sending that to the whole board, as well as posting on the policy advisory report uh, page uh, that those proposals. Okay, Mr. Sweeney. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Valier, a question about the um, policy intervention. <clears throat> I'm sorry, the crisis management. When when you all are looking at that, will you be looking at the alternative models of sending a, a non-police team versus sending a mixed team of police plus mental health? And would you also be looking at whether or not there was a need to send police in you know, some percentage of matters where only mental health people were sent and, and kind of consequences or developments related to that? Would that be within the scope of what you would be looking at? Uh, I think... The, there are the different models, not necessarily evaluating specifically which is the most appropriate, but just but acknowledging that there are different ways that um, or different types of models. You know, the cahoots model, which is seen, which is often framed as the non-police, often co-responds with police officers as well. So that would come into any of the you know any of the work as we're looking at you know, the, 
the number of calls for services that would be, you know, non-police responders versus co-response. And so I think, you know, those naturally, uh, those different types of response models would naturally come out in an analysis as sort of an estimate of, um, of the demand. Well, similarly, would there be some kind of attempt to evaluate success? Um, I'm not, I'm not sure yes. so, of that is. But. Yeah, so um, there's a couple pieces there, right? So, yes, there, you know, we would look at existing research on which models are seen as most successful and have evidence behind them. Um, unfortunately, many of the model of the programs are very new. And so as we're looking at, you know, at different planning, uh, pro planning projects where different cities have, you know, done some of these estimates on, uh, calls for service, we would try, we would probably be looking at pretty new programs. Um, so often there's not a lot of evidence, but we would look or as much evidence as we could find um, on different types of calls for service, the eff efficacy of the programs, just as, as background research to um, contextualize any of the work that we do. So one of the things that I'm curious about is we have seen the failures in the situations where police um, have been called and and the situation um, is worse um, and or somebody gets hurt or killed. Um, would the analysis also look at where no police are called, whether the situation gets worse and whether there's any harm that results from those as well? Uh, we would certainly look for any existing research on that um, and include that in kind of a background discussion of the programs. Um, I have not yet seen very robust research on that, but we are planning to talk with, um, as part of the proposal, would to work with um, organizations that are doing mental health treatment that are doing crisis intervention, as well as other programs. And so those are issues that um, we would be very interested in coming up in some of the webinars I've seen with um, folks from Eugene and Cahoots program. Um, they've said that those incidents are pretty rare, just as um, you know, the incidents where people are being harmed are relatively um, rare as well. So we would definitely keep an eye toward trying to understand both the pros and cons um, in how that happens. One of the areas where we might really look for that is on the emergency um, dispatching, right? So looking at how uh, dispatchers are involved in determining which calls go to police, which calls would go to co-responders, and which would go to non-police responders. And different cities have different models of that, and so we would be reviewing the different methods that that cities have put in place to try to divert those calls in a way that maximizes safety for everybody. Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Um, I wanted to say just like two things really fast. So one is just like it's hard to measure. And, um, and I want to echo what Dr. Villia said. It's hard to measure when police are not called because our systems are not set up in that way to measure impact when those bodies are not involved. And then two, I wanted to flag, um, uh, well, actually two, I just wanted to commend uh, Dr. Villia and the research team for coming up with, with these type of uh, policy recommendations. I love this um, because it pushes the conversation forward it broadens the horizon and it expands the conversation around what public safety is. And it really shows like the potential impact that this board can have on the larger conversation around how do we make communities safe, right? And how do we make them less harmful? 
for folks. Um, and so I'm just saying, like, I'm loving this direction, and I hope that we can keep doing this and continuously going, doing these type of reports over and over again so we can really bring our people along because I think we have to bring our people along to get it to get it to a point where our communities are safe for everyone. So yeah, I, I just wanted to say like, I really appreciate this. Thank you, Mr. Kamagooch. Ms. Ross. Yes, and I also would like to thank the community, Noor and uh, NAACP for requesting this information. Yeah, I, I echo those statements, both from Mr. Kamalgush and Ms. Ross. I think it's great that we're doing this type of work and also great that we're doing it at the request of the community uh, so we can keep you know, getting involved in, in these issues and putting out great research. So I think we I mean, at least wait until after the Policing Policy Commission um, recommendations come out so that we can then maybe tailor our uh, advise the proposals to what is missing from those, if that makes sense, Mr. Kamaguchi. Um, yes, I, I also wanted to bring up uh, something that was said to la at the last meeting, where we wouldn't, we won't really know what's in the um, policing commission report because it will be refined by the time we see it. So I also wanted to voice that and hold that. Thank you. Okay, so I, I, yeah, I don't know if we want to, does this then get presented to the full board? But if, if we're not gonna take action on it yet, I think it, we can just wait on it, Mr. Sweeney. I, I think we should present them to the board and start the process. And I think we should have the conversation with the board as to the priorities. And I think both of them are, are, are um, matters that would be appropriate for the board to consider and then approve and line them both up um, to, to um, be initiated um, and, and um, just figure out which one is the first priority and, and then go after that. And, and then if something else comes up in the meantime, that the proposal needs to be modified, then we can deal with that modification um, uh, further down the line, but we can at least get the process kind of started or calendared or, you know, um, and, and go forward from there. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. All right, I think we'll present them at the next board meeting then next week. Um, I think it's also worth thinking about you know, how do, how do we deal with these incoming? I mean, say we had five of these requests from community organizations at a time. I mean, do we have a wait list? Or I think we need to have a, a system for responding to community organizations, um, you know, not to discount their issues, but also to make them realize the priorities that we have. Um, just something to consider. I'll move on to, thank you, Dr. Belier. Mr. Campbell Gooch. I, th I think, um, sorry, I, I, I think um, a beautiful thing that we can provide organizations with is how they can help us grow capacity so we can respond faster. So that was, that's, what, that's what be my tip. Uh, um, yeah, because I think if these organizations have very specific demands to organize around, they can help I turn around, our turn around, and help them feel supported at the same time. Very good point, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Thank you. I the last thing on here uh, is critical crisis plan discussion. This is something we've talked about, touched on, touched on briefly in past meetings about you know having a plan of action, but, you know a communications plan as well in case something happens. You know what happens if there's a police shooting? What happens? if there's an immediate incident that needs our response. I want or I would like volunteers from the board to work on this, especially I, I think it would be good for volunteers from the community to or community representing board members 
to have an input on, you know, what type of response is best. Um, so I'd welcome discussion on that, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, I was gonna say I'm down to 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 jam out on that. I'm just I'm also curious about what other board members think the response should be. I think this is something that we can refine and workshop once we have a process in place. I think the the first thing is creating a process or, or what we think a good process would look like, and then we can present it to the board or to a smaller committee of the board and get their thoughts on it and go back to to work on it from there unless, you know, they all like it. Director Fitcher, do you have anything to add on that point? Yeah, sure. So when we started talking about this critical crisis plan, it's something that I think has been weighing on me um, because I, I think that there has to be some steps um, that, not, that not only are um, associated with the board, but also as well as with the district attorney's office, with um, the police department. I mean, there, I think that the community wants to know if there's a crisis, what type of information um, is going to be made available to them. Um, and so I think that having a committee um, for us to sit down and kind of, you know, powwow this out so that those are things that I can take back to the district attorney's office, as well as to the police department too, to say, hey, this is what the community's needs are and this is what they would like um, to be released when there's a critical incident. Um, I don't think that people want to um, just be kind of like in the dark about situations that are happening. So um, I think that we have a part and then there's another, there's, we have our part and then there's a separate part as well. And so I think that we need to just figure out what it is that we want to do and then, you know, sit down with the district attorney's office and figure out what it is that they want to do as well or what they would like for us or how we could work together in collaboration on what should be released. Thank you, Director Fitcher. Uh, Mr. Sweeney? Um, two thoughts. I, 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 I agree with you as far as um, having a community-based workshopping of what our response would look like. And that might be one of these committees that we've talked about, um, which is a combination of um, board and um, outsider or non-board members from the community as to what they would want to know, what they think to be most crucial at the time when an incident occurs in um, kind of the response of the information um, coming from us. I think that's probably a component of it. Um, but I also think that probably other agencies like ours have some kind of crisis plan. And as, as a component of whatever plan we come up with, it probably would be useful to reach out to some of those other entities like Atlanta or DC or whatever and see what they have so that we can learn from them and, and maybe use that as somewhat of a framework for whatever we want. That's a good point, Mr. Sweeney. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Uh, I also wanted to say like that was a great point and just like also build up on it. I think this is a place where we can engage uh, Sheila Clemens Lee and other folks, uh, families, um, to at least talk, at least center their experience on how the initial impact was and then just kind of like build around that. Thank you, Mr. Kamalish. Uh Director Fitcher. Yeah, and so I have a list of the of, of a couple of the um, different agencies across the country who have had recent um, issues that you know that we kind of partner with. So one is Seattle. I have one for um, Seattle. I have Atlanta because Atlanta, of course, had a couple shootings recently, and then I also have. Um, 
Oakland listed. And so I was going to reach out to them and see what if they have something in place and, you know, what their process was so that when we do meet that I could have that information available to you. Thank you, Director Kitchard. Um, so I, I think, is it worth presenting to the whole board next week or do we already start here and, uh, you know, decide which committee is going to take it or does anyone volunteer to lead that effort or at least, you know, help plan it so we can get it started? Ms. Ross. I'd like to see if we have other board members that would be interested in leading this, um, you know, leave it open to the whole board. Okay. I agree. Let's then request uh, at the next board meeting on Wednesday that we get some volunteers to help start working on this. If there's no other discussion on that, um, I think that's it. New, any new business or announcements? I will say that we had our TBI meeting. Um, it was on the 6th of November and that meeting went well. Um, they, there was the TBI MOU that we presented. Um, there was some language change. They had a little bit of concern about one portion of it. They also wanted it to be a um, document that was, I guess, um, the document would be would we incorporate the OPA um, because they wanted to have just one document. Um, and so they're working on a document that would give the OPA and ourselves the same type of access. Um, I, the, Director Rausch was concerned that um, if if there could be some issues, if that one particular um, department or agency had more access to the other. And so he wants to have this kind of um, contemporaneous access. And so they're going to reword it and then present it to us. And so we're just waiting on that. Um, and we haven't heard back from them as of yet. Thank you, Director Pritchard. Um, I, I'll add, I won't be able to connect next week for the meeting. So I request Mr. Kamlovich as vice chair uh, that you lead the meeting if you're able to. Definitely can. Thank you. And I'll, I'll make sure to have some stuff prepared for you because I know we're kind of forwarding things on from this committee to, um, from the executive committee to uh, the full board meeting. So I'll make sure to have that all detailed for you. Uh, thank you. If there's no other new business or announcements, we can adjourn if there's a motion to adjourn. I make a motion that we adjourn. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Is there a second? Uh, second. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Uh, do a roll call here, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Aye. Ms. Ross. Aye. Mr. Sweeney. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Thank you so much. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.